I'm Spencer Bailey. This is Time Sensitive. Hey everyone, starting with a quick note that we've just launched a brand new membership subscription program at The Slowdown. This includes a slate of subscriber-only newsletters, original content, and exclusive access to talks and events. As an independent media company, we rely on great brand partnerships, but subscriber support is another essential component. To date, we've kept all of our content free, but almost four years in, we feel it's the right moment to create a membership program so we can continue growing and delivering storytelling to you at the highest level. To become a member, go to slowdown.tv slash subscribe. That's slowdown.tv slash subscribe. So let's get into the episode. This week, I'm in conversation with Anders Byreal, the CEO of the Denmark-based textile company Kvadra. For the uninitiated, that's K-V-A-D-R-A-T, Kvadra. I first met Anders in Copenhagen in May 2019, right as the Slowdown was launching. And ever since, I've wanted to have him on the show. You'll hear on this episode, he's the rare CEO who not only fully understands the true meaning of company culture, he lives and breathes it, and even has, in his own way, created an alternative meaning of the phrase. At Kavadra, where he's been the CEO for 25 years, he has turned what was once a small, fairly dusty family design business into a global giant with a thousand employees, hundreds of millions in annual revenue, and a deep engagement in the world of art. Under his watch, Kvadra has collaborated with designers such as Raf Simmons, Ronan and Erwan Berlek, and Peter Saville, as well as on dozens of art projects around the world, at institutions including the New Museum, the Guggenheim, Tate Modern, and Denmark's own Louisiana Museum of Modern Art. Kvadra has also partnered with brands like Jaguar Land Rover, Bang & Olufsen, and Adidas Originals. On the surface, textiles might not necessarily be the sexiest of businesses, but at Kavadra, Anders has made them unquestionably cool. On the episode, we get into all this, as well as two of his greatest passions, poetry and photography. And just a quick note here that there are an unusually large number of references on the episode, so please see the show notes or check out the full transcript at timesensitive.fm if you want to go a bit deeper. I'd also like to thank our Season 7 presenting sponsor, Lacole School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. With permanent campuses in both Paris and Hong Kong, and opening this year a third campus in Shanghai, as well as various traveling schools, Lacole offers a wide range of classes, each lasting from two to four hours. With a maximum size of 12 students, these courses are taught by a group of 50-some teachers, art historians, gemologists, jewelers, and artisans, all of them experts in their fields. Lacole's teachers bring a specific hands-on approach and a particularly high level of jewelry expertise that can't be found anywhere else. Art history lessons, for example, are based on unique historical pieces taken straight from the Lacole collection. Introductory courses on jewelry making techniques are given by high-level practitioners. And gemology is taught by observing real stones and using professional gemology instruments. You can learn more about Lacole and its many course offerings at www.lacolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleef. A-R-P-E-L-S dot com. And now, here's my conversation with Anders. Hi, Anders. Welcome to Time Sensitive. Hey, hey, good to see you. Good to see what you, What a too. beautiful location you got here. <laughs> really, really cozy. So, you were mentioning that you were reading a book on the flight over here and pulled a quote. I thought we'd start there. Yeah, I wanted to bring something for you. <laughs> oh, well, actually, I just picked this book up in the bookshop in uh, Arlanda, Stockholm Airport. And uh, I saw a documentary about uh, Annie Eno. She won the Nobel Prize last year. And uh, the book is called uh, The Years. And you always need some intellectual food. So I just need, and I was a little bit low on, uh, I didn't bring that much to read. And then I started reading it, and then I actually was mesmerized. And then I thought of the opening statement, and then I thought of a quote I would bring it to you is saying, all the images will disappear. Hmm. 
Wow. And how do you interpret that? <laughs> I'll help you out. <laughs> it's more, you also have a Tolstoy quote in the beginning. It's very much this about what we think is important today will maybe be totally irrelevant in the future. So it's showing in a way the power of time, the things move, and actually also a lot of things will be, she's using the world disappear, I would maybe say erased or so actually, the, the, the context we are living in, the things we are interested in or obsessed with, most of it will be gone. And why I actually disagree with her, partly, and that, was, and that could be part of our conversation, but also the power of arts, I would say music, literature, and art, contemporary art, or art in general. I think that's some of the things where time doesn't really matter that you can actually, uh, now there's Vermeer. I haven't seen it at, uh, it's one of the must-see shows in Amsterdam. I've read about people are nearly crying when they're seeing it's the biggest Vermeer show ever. So, so. Completely so, sold out. <laughs> so is it, okay. But also I think it's one of the things we share and one of my passions, uh, contemporary culture and especially art, um, that somehow it can stand the, the test of time, and it can have a relevance in another context. So uh, I just thought she was so radical, so I thought it was a nice opening. Mm, that is a great place to start. And part of why I was so excited to have you on the podcast, something we've been trying to do for yeah, a totally. few years now, yeah. um, and I'm really excited to be with you here today, is that you've built this incredibly special culture at Kavadra. I'm probably mispronouncing no, Kavadra. No, no, you're doing very well. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and not only at, I want to add, but of, culture of Kavadra. And I think there's an interesting sort of distinction in, in making that of clear. You've previously said, we are not a company, we are a culture. And so I wanted to ask, how do you define and think about the phrase company culture? And how would you describe the culture you've built at the company over the past two plus decades? Um, yeah, it's a long journey. My team sometimes forget is you start from, you are actually a very, very small entity. We were 70 people. We were doing 16 million euro. We were very Scandinavian based. So, so you dream but that's not the same as you suddenly go. You, in a way, it's like a stairway. Two things about the crowd culture. When I was there and I came, I joined the business. I came out of university. I had a degree in IP law. And just starting the business, I worked as assistant director. And then I became commercial officer. But observing the business, I just realized it's very much some few people who create the business. And it's just, uh, it's a creative director, maybe plus a couple of, and the creative by, director, by the way, was my father. By the way, the business is owned by two families. So it's, but it's a very, very small group, some few, few people creating the culture. So it was the idea of, you can say in a way on, in two perspectives to create the culture of the business and in a way be on the inside or the inside, which is the true culture start building a culture with a passion for architecture, contemporary art, and design, and those three keywords, and starting to evolve this and build knowledge as a group. So, but you, of course, you are, you're a small organization. We went from 70, now we're 1,000. So it's like different milestones you get to, but it's this on. Uh, yeah, this ongoing movement, but actually that everybody is invited. I just actually this morning had a Teams meeting with uh, 10 new employees, and it's called Contemporary Culture, and you it's ending on. Like, you should be a part of this. We want to invite you in. We actually expect this from you. You should be engaged in contemporary culture. Some of the power, for example, now we got like... Uh, yeah, I'm just counting how many companies we have. We have something like 40 incorporated businesses. But also every year, they report into me what have they done in contemporary culture events. What have they, and they need to do two per, per country. 
around the world. So, for example, the Italians, they go to Venice Binale, they see the show of the whole company, they go, they get a tour, have conversations, or the French take the train to Marseille, they say Le Corbusier, they see other things. So it's also the belief in the collective power of engagement in the culture, and then it keeps evolving. Our community, which is also our clients, they sense this. Then on the other side, the other side is delivering the creative output. Then we also started from being this Scandinavian company. Or really, we actually were a company a little bit like My Meco. We were very much like, actually doing better than My Meco then, uh, but doing a very home textile printed cottons, but working a lot with artists actually in the early days, in the 60s, uh, from 68 and on. That was the beginning, but extremely local, very, very Scandinavian. So that was actually looking for talent. So we started in Northern Europe, adding talent, looking for talent, and then slowly been growing. How we are working with creativity is also, now I know you had Peter Saville here, <laughs> who is an amazing gentleman. And um, it was actually also ambition to really work with the best, work with the best of the best. And that's why I often call us or mention us a little bit like a publishing house or record label that you also need to groom talent. You need to build a platform for future talent. So it's been this journey where we actually, the day you think you, you reach the top, then you're all the, already on the way down the hill or the mountain. Uh, but when that said, we, we, we reach out. Many collaborations took us places we couldn't even imagine, like, for example, the Brulex, where we've done quite spaces, interpretation of spaces. We've done all kinds of different products, try to create new topologies. Now Ivan is created direct on a new venture. We're doing reinventing the, the window, but also other collaborations. I've seen ones that started out in many ways, actually, were thought as more just to inspire ourselves and our, but then we like, wow, this is actually getting traction. This is becoming a whole entity of its own. So actually now I'm sorry that I keep talking, but also talking about time because you, you have this great line for this um, show, if I may call it that, how <laughs> this podcast that I was also reflecting that I think a part of the power is also that it's, we are thinking very long-term we can get back to how we run the business, but also in our creative relationships, we don't really want to, to work with somebody who's maybe done one very beautiful thing that could be commercial for us, but we're not really interested. We only want us, I would say, sign on to sound a <laughs> record label, but work with somebody there. We can see we want to work with this person for 10 yeah, years or Multiple years. albums. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and maybe only the third album will be great. <laughs> so you also you need some patience when you work with people. Mm. So I think this longevity in the creative relationships is creating something very special. And uh, yeah, and, and that way, keep building the community that they become a part of our community. And uh, like now, now you met Peter, who's been extremely important on being like our visual uh, art director on the whole visual side for many years. You brought him in for the logo originally, right? That yes, was, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> and he... He's a great thinker. I've been asking him to write some books. Maybe you could do it with him because you really <laughs> need to get going on it. One of the things he helped us also, we're working with yeah, logo, but somebody else is doing the logo. He's doing the thinking and the direction. And uh, The logo is the springboard. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I'm with that you. Became... No, but that's that's how we started. We just said, who's the best in the world? <laughs> we, said, we considered two free people. And, and he also brought David Ajay into the Yeah, film. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Who designed fully, the fully. London showroom? Yes, exactly, exactly. So, so it's this is or or like uh, Thomas Demont, who I met via Luciana, and uh, I didn't know him. He brought me to Rosme Torgel. We could get back to that to Rosme Torgel to Olafur. and that's how everything is snowballing. Olafur Eliasson for the listeners. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, and, so, that, and that's what's so fascinating is this list of. Artists, creatives, practitioners, designers, architects, Jean Nouvel, for example, people you have worked with over the years and gotten to do these extraordinary things with all through this medium of textile, mm, mm, which truly. I think is really remarkable because a lot of times a company 
comes in and they just end up saying, oh, we'll sponsor your show or yeah. we'll do, but actually you are sort of, we'll do that. And, mm. and mm. then the textile gets to actually be innovated on and pushed in new directions. Fully, 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 fully. You could say when we set out originally, we had those contemporary artists who, who work mostly the Scandinavian and Danish. I was very focused on architecture. So this is why we have this leadership in global architecture during textile solutions. So I was very focused. So we turned actually, it was more designers during the lead and also during most of our things. And then conversation kept going with the, with the artist. And then we, we did the first projects with artists. And then the feedback was, let's make it into kind of a program. So there is a logic. And that's maybe one of my weaknesses. We don't know where we're going to go. I love that it's totally open and also love when it's open space or we ask Rolex to design Los Angeles. We don't know what's going to happen. So I like this. But back to it. So we were very focused. So we made the art route into a program and we also brought two uh, curators onto the program also because that it was not all about myself and what I liked but also actually bringing two young curators, uh, 18 young, years younger than me, female, global, to have the conversation of where are we going to go. And also that we not only would be, we were in a little bit on a roll where it was becoming very much the blue chip in contemporary art loved us. So, so it kept, but we were just saying we also have an ob obligation like on design to also work with people who's on the way where we can actually make a difference and maybe also even help them in their career. So back to the the program. So the program became, it was actually formulated in dialogue with Thomas Damon. And it was to do things that were temporary, who were public, so everybody have access to it. And uh, also that we could actually add something, that it was a co-production. And actually the first person who kind of I wouldn't say got it, but we had a lot of museum collaboration. We probably done something like 40 to 50 uh, collaborations now with institutions around the world. You name them, we got them. Ludwig, Luciana, Tate, um, um, New Museum. Um, uh, yeah, so... so uh, Guggenheim. <laughs> Guggenheim, yeah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. Um, uh, what to call the big new one in Hong Kong? M plus. We M plus is in the pipeline. Kanasawa, we're talking. Yeah, so we try to find two routes. So the blue chip, and but also people who is on the on the way, and also working immaterial. And it's the absolute exception if it's not like gone again and then just documented. But also now it comes. Now I get back to it. it's truly me. But also the person who kind of for the first time formulated was actually Massimiliano Gini from New Museum here in New York, who said that collage role, they come in with the artist, they help the artist do a better show than they planned to do, and then they leave with the artist. And that was many institutions couldn't really get it. Like, you are here, you need to be corporate sponsor for five years, and we need to collaborate. Like, yeah, But it's not really because we are coming with the artist, and we just want to build the best possible thing for, for example, Luciana, where I'm actually, by the way, serve as a, two foundations at the board. But when we work with Pipilotti there, and now I also know the inside of a museum, you have a certain budget. But you can say, us entering, then maybe the budget is maybe nearly the double because we come with money, but we also come with skills. We can help build the set. We can help do what the artists dream about. Extraordinary example in the fall of 2021 at the Guggenheim Right oh, yeah. down the middle of the rotunda yeah. was this massive textile on which artwork by Wu Song was presented and projected. Incredible. Fully, fully. And also it's showing that this about things can, thank God, creativity cannot be programmed. You don't know how good it's going to be. You know, sometimes also things get mediocre. All right. <laughs> but sometimes also <laughs> it takes some, off. Some, yeah. yeah, but some things also just takes off and become very poetic. Well, I, I, I wanted to ask you oh, about please. the new Triple Folly structure on your campus by Thomas Demond, because Triple Folly is architecture, but it almost looks like something made out of paper intentionally. And it serves this sort of 
practical role, which is it's a meeting space, but it also, I think, serves this metaphorical role for explaining the role of art within Kvadrat. Mm-hmm. Fully. I was hoping you might speak to that a little. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you already done it better than I could. <laughs> Here it was truly, I think even Thomas was a bit nervous about it also because he never built a 3D structure. He, he had one as a model in Venice Binale when Sijima was uh, directing it, something that could have been, I think it was called Kettle House that was... Uh, a house from from China, uh, a house that was not torn down, and then he rebuilt it as a model, and it was supposed to go into a public artwork in Switzerland, but was voted down by the community. So it's the first time he's building something this size. The exploring thing is that it's undefined. That we we let's see where it, actually also the purpose or or where where, where how we're going to use it is still a bit undefined, and I think that's what we like, and I love it. <laughs> That is undefined. I think if you see the structure, somebody listening, see the structure, it probably became a hybrid between, I would say, 70% sculpture and 30% uh, architecture. And at some point, Thomas also had to, I think he wanted to do it all on his own, but he had to- to, Bring in an architecture (laughs) firm. (laughs) Bring in uh, Adam Caruso, who is a dear friend of his, to, uh, (laughs) to make sure we could close the doors and it's not raining in and so on. So it became this hybrid, uh, and the key space, it's it's three different paper cardboard. It's actually, I don't know what it's called, the, the paper hat that the, uh, uh, the, the chef in a, in a diner is wearing. And then it's, it's a sheet from a lawyer, a paper sheet. And the last one is a plate, a paper plate. So it's like three elements of paper. And they're, they're making the roofs. And I think that gives some excitement also to our employees, but to our community. That's also why we don't really have a fine line between employees and our our clients and our community. So we see it as one community and also the energy about doing things and see where we're going to go. So, so now it became... And while I was talking about the shapes, the tall hat is we have a Rosemary Torkel work there in there, which was the second art project we did for Ludwig, which is 1.2 tons of wool. It's 12 meters long, six meters high, one meter deep, the biggest work she ever did. Also the room has a like nearly like, uh, I don't know call it called or similar religious feeling or very poetic feeling. Sacred almost. Yeah, sacred. Yeah feeling this space so you nearly get quiet when you're sitting in there and it's it's immense beauty and of course it's also that's a power of contemporary art that it's not only the feel there's also content yeah i mean you've talked about this you've said that you see art on the front line it's sensing what's happening in the world the way we're feeling and Peter Saville, similarly, of, of working with Kvadrat, has said that it's less of a business relationship and more akin to that of artist and patron. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to ask, you know, I mean, it's interesting in this time that we live in, companies, especially companies at your scale or beyond your scale, tend to become all about efficiency. Mm-hmm. And they forget some of the freedom that comes with thinking the way perhaps an artist would. And so I was wondering if you could speak to how you see this. And Kavadra also follows this, what you call conscious design approach. And so how does that all intersect, this idea of conscious design, but also this idea of artistic engagement, if I can call it Yeah, no, fully, fully, fully. I think also... Talking about time today, <laughs> what I learned with my moving through the the art and the design world, and at least my own uh, the approach to design, I, I really realized that the, if we are in design, still we are a design company. We've been collaborating with a lot of artists, and we're actually going to do things with artists. That's that's uh, well, Jan Vo has a, yeah, actually a, an industrial collection. Yeah, totally, and more to come with more people, and. Um, but talking about design, I think the best design has artistic edge. I really think so. Or oh, is artistic. That's going back to your question that 
Uh, of course, I think the iPhone is a beautiful object and it's working extremely well and it's, it's very well designed and produced and uh, worked through and tested and so on. But I, I just, I have to say with our creative teams, we got more creative teams working on and collaborating with people. We always work with external people uh, or external designers. The best things are when there is this element of freedom, this element of the unpredictable and, and where you are stretching or you're trying to go somewhere. And the tension between yeah. that and what we might call the efficient. Mm, yeah. But if we, I have to say efficient is truly something I really never cared about more or less. Also in the business, we are trying to learn it because now we are machine and we are like thousand people. We are, and we need to tick like I call it a Swiss clock. I say, forget the Danish clocks. It needs to tick because that's of course also a part of the experience. You get a product, we, we work on a big project. I, I would probably guess we're involved in like 70% of all landmarks in the world. This is also a part that people sometimes forget about for art, that they think we are this artistic and uh, we are brand and we are culture. But of course, there's also this uh, Swiss clock under the surface that makes things before I start saying something bad about But I would say when you talk efficiency and design, that, that's where I really go, go. And I see really a tendency... I was talking with a friend who's, uh, I've not worked for, for one of the biggest American companies in industrial design, and just telling about how things are going in-house, how things are getting extremely corporate, how things are, and I think you are losing the artistic side of it. I know it sounds naive, but I think if you look at amazing American design companies who were created in the 50s and 60s, there was that energy. You will lose it. So. For example, now in Milan, this this uh, here in uh, it's in a month, isn't it? Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah, Milan Design Week. Yeah, yeah. It's it, we, we're going to show a, a textile collection that's coming out of paintings. So, uh, and this is Quadrat Core. This is the architectural part of the Quadrat, but it's uh, Ronan's paintings, his works that you've probably seen, that we had translated into different types of textiles. So it's a very poetic, very. Do we know if this is going to, I'm not sure, <laughs> I don't know how commercial it's going to be, but it's also, we need to push the boundary. We need to put new milestones around. We need to push it. We can't look back. We need to look ahead. We need to try to formulate the next. And yeah, if we're not trying, we, we, we're not going to go somewhere else, right? I love that you're saying all this because one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was the decentralized nature of your business, which was prior to you taking it over, quite centralized, quite Danish, quite hierarchical. And during your time at the helm at the company, you've kind of shifted things. You've and part of this is also getting away from like a more rules-based approach. Mm, oh yeah. <laughs> and so I was wondering, you know. How have you gone about this sort of letting go, if I could call it that? And like, how do you create an unstructured culture while still scaling, mm. still maintaining quality and still increasing revenue? All things that any business wants, but without losing that poetry and that soul. Oh, great question. Thank you. <laughs> you could say how I look at the culture is also... It has two sides. It has uh, a warm side, but it also have, I don't know if it's a cold side, but it, so it's also, if we also have the Swiss side or the Scandinavian side. This is about the clock. That's, so there's a lot of things that where we have conceptualized things and they're ticking and we know we have created ways of working that where when you start us, I was just talking about the new people starting here that we know how you can become successful. So trust us on this. We want your feedback. That's very Scandinavian. Danes, you, Danes are very critical to our authority. So just speak up. You know, it's not a problem. So we have this feedback culture and so on. But th when that's said, that's the side of the business where we are. We develop ways of working, and but still in what I call a, a, a freedom in a framework. So we create framework. That's also when you are, for example, a commercial person at Quadrat, we have like 140. When they go into a big project with a 
one of we have, I want a lot of NDAs, one of the world's greatest businesses. And we send this person. This is a person who can make the decisions. You don't need to uh, to phone a regional director or managing director in a company or in a local company. You, when you meet the person, this is an empowered person. They have freedom in their framework. They can make the decision. So that's that's the energy of being well organized in a way on on the fundamentals. So that's the part of it. Then what we offer is. And not everybody needs to be a part of it, but we have slowly, it's really turning the engagement in contemporary culture, that we see people knowing a lot, following things. And I also believe the community, through conversations about creativity, because our touch, we probably have conversations, we're seeing 25,000 architects and designers around the world many times during the year. So the conversation for them, the feedback from them, it just keep feeding the culture and keep moving I, us along. I love this. I'm struck by this tension too. And I, I'm thinking about uh, Giulio Rodolfo here and his materializing color project. Mm -hmm. And just like the crazy inefficiency of that project, yeah, yeah. which is like, you know, I'm out in nature, just kind of like yeah. hanging out, picking flowers yeah, yeah, and like exactly. looking at colors. And, but, the other side of that project yeah. is this incredibly beautiful, durable, long-lasting, and actually, I would say, quite, I guess, efficient product. Mm, mm. And so this dichotomy between yeah. inefficiency and efficiency Fully, yeah. is... You need to be inefficient at a certain point. You can say it's also you make some choices that you want to be value-based, and you try to let people make the decisions based on the values. Also, just so we take the sugar coating away, it's also not always that easy because as you grow as a company, you need to comply to legal things. You need to comply to legislation about personal data, GDPR in Europe, other things. So there's also this that's sneaking in on you. Actually, sustainability is also a very a powerhouse and very exciting, but there's also a lot of organizing around it. So finding that balance with organizing those things that are also put into the world to make the world better and still having the freedom. So I think that's probably the tension uh, that you, you're you seeing. I, I would say something just to flash it here. <laughs> uh, I'll be Thursday in, at Howard Business School and the, the second case about Corrado is coming out. So we also have study for young MBAs. The first case came out in 14. Yeah, called, I, I read okay, it. I read it. Leading for innovation. Now comes a new one called Focus, Execute and Grow. But it's very much cases about how to grow a global business. But the core of it is also, also how we work with culture. From a professional point, of course, uh, proud of yeah, people and, and studying self, this. Selfishly, that's sort of the point of this interview right now. I mean, I, I, I really wanted it to come across as mm -hmm. Anders is not your ordinary CEO. In fact, we have very few CEOs that have come on this podcast. We had, Thank you. We had Thank Andrea you. Illy, the chairman of Illy Cafe, who also is very involved in the world of art. Sure. Um, and we've had, I know him. <laughs> yeah, and we of course have had our our mutual friend uh, Christian Madsberg, who you introduced me to. <laughs> I would say it's very rare to find a CEO who's thinking about culture in the way that you are and engaging with it at a corporate level in the way you are, and also on a personal level, mm -hmm, which maybe surely. we'll touch on. But <laughs> sure. you know, you've previously emphasized the importance of creating a vision that carries emotion. And I feel like we don't get to hear enough talk about emotion from executives. Could you elaborate on this a little bit? Speak to how you think about emotion as a leader and a CEO. I mean, clearly, Kavadra has cultural intelligence, but also, I would argue, emotional intelligence embedded into it. You could say um, where to go. I'm just thinking more things. That's why I need to organize my thoughts. We are working in the creative industry, and I think people can feel if you're passionate. And of course, if you are the CEO and you're passionate about it and passionate about creative culture, uh, it will go through the organization. And people, when they interact with some young salesperson we have in Chicago or in Shanghai, they will sense some of this energy. One of my thoughts also is actually a passion for for creative culture and producing creative culture is actually also a passion for 
I use the world. I love to be a little provocative. I would say beauty. It's all like we're sitting in this. This is a place of beauty. Your place here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah me, I love books. We are packed in books. We have beautiful objects around us. Uh, so it's also... So I think this this passion for this type of spaces and, and and you got nice art on the wall, not irrelevant art, you know. Somebody been thinking it fits. So this passion we need to bring, and it it goes all the way through. And and to say, then you can get financially successful. Howard Business School will not write a case of uh, if we are not financially successful. But when that said, I think people who get successful, is when they are passionate about something, and then the financial thing come after. If I should say an extreme example, because I'm in the jury now of Entrepreneur of the Year in Denmark with Ernst and & Young, and there's some of the key people in Denmark, Danish business, and then uh, sitting one of, actually the biggest PE fund in Denmark, the CEO there is sitting there, he invites me for his annual conference. So I go for that. I thought, okay, maybe I can learn something. Let me also be a good sport. Uh, let me go and see what those guys... I was like, I was so scared. It was like such a PA firm a whole day, it was the church of money. They were only talking about money a whole day. It was like, if you're a priest, like you, you see the devil. And there's actually an old Danish expression that you, if money is your master, you're really in trouble. That's an old Danish expression. <laughs> so I'm just saying, I think that's where some CEOs really, if you don't, then go do something else. I, I could. I, I think some great CEOs could be passionate about, like I love a small, they're not doing that well, a small Danish brewery called Miguelia. Maybe you know them. There. I know them. <laughs> yeah, I love them. And they're not doing very well. <laughs> Maybe they're too passionate, but they're so passionate about what they're doing. There's so much excitement. They're very innovative. So I really believe that's how this energy is extremely important. Another thing, maybe more general thing about leadership I believe very much, we had years where we grew a lot. We had people who burning out, which is not good for our community. So we also, we introduced in a way empathy. So this may be the closest word to what you're talking about, social intelligence, which is in a way very too interlinked. So one of our four words is actually empathy. So it's actually, it's, it's passion, it's quality, it's love for design or understanding of creativity, and then it's empathy. So we also live the value of empathy. So it's actually also when we work with all, all relationship, of course, with clients, try to listen to the clients. Where are they actually? But actually also on the internal lines, have you been fair to this person? The power of success comes also from teams, teams being successful because we are on locations all around the world. So it's the team in Singapore, it's the team in Italy who is successful. It's not really the mothership will help them. So creating... So back to empathy, and then end of the day, which maybe it's banal, but also success comes from understanding yourself. So also about well, it's I love that you say that. Actually, um, last year I interviewed Tina Roth Eisenberg, who created Creative Mornings, mm -hmm. this amazing organization, and she spoke about a heart centered approach. All right, all right. And I loved this idea of of being heart centered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, I think mm -hmm. that there's not enough leaders who think that way. Mm -hmm. Again, it's like the the church of money or something, yeah, you know. Exactly, exactly. All hail the dollar. Yeah, but exactly. Like, it's not like... It can't be everything. No, no. Do you think that companies like Jaguar, Land Rover, Muji, Adidas Originals, Bang & Olufsen, these companies that have created partnerships with you, mm -hmm. What is it about Quadrat that they feel drawn to? And and I mean, there's a sort of cult quality to what you've built mm -hmm. without it being an actual cult, of no, course. No, no. If we learn, we are not allowed to say cult, right? <laughs> 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 we get a lot of requests. So we've been very, very hard and, and maybe not hard enough and uh, on choosing who to collaborate with. You can't say no to a Stan Smith, though. I mean, <laughs> no, to, no, make we a, couldn't. to make a they Stan Smith ma sneaker. They, it's sold out in four days. What's the idea? I, I couldn't even get one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Nobody got one. They were, they just went out. So, yeah, so we did Stan Smith. And in a way, we also, we are this cult brand. I'm actually okay about being a cult brand. When that said, then it's, it's also, we're not really known by that many people. We are known in the design community. We are a very strong brand in the design community and the AD community and people who are 
interested in design. So you could say those, for example, Jaguar Land Rover, who I'm, is actually my own account, or I'm, I'm following them. But you can say the side effect has been they do a small film about us, five million people see it. Yeah, Boy, so, exactly. So, I mean, yeah, or the Stan Smith, or or BNO. Many people know us from BNO. So even some people think we're doing. <laughs> that's who, who we are because they 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 meet us. So, so in a way, it's also a way. Of course, it's a way of getting to know that we are this this global specialist in in design uh, textile. Uh, I'm thinking of other collaborations. Yeah, we got a couple of collaborations also now at fashion, some of the best, world's best fashion companies. And it's not so much business, actually. And now it's not turned into a collab. It's more we do textiles for them. But where the where the energy comes is sometimes when you plug in, I'll not mention the name, but one of the best Parisian brands, but they're 10,000 people. They got a lot of R&D. We, in a way, like-minded. So it's also connecting with people who can take us out of our industry because our industry interior is a relatively small industry. Yeah. And that's the same actually also with Jaguar Land Rover. They got an engineering team and a, a design team of 300 people. So it's also talking with them have, and they have a lot of research. They actually got very strong sustainable ambitions. You can say the whole automotive industry know they need to transform if they want to roll in the future. So it's more those conversations, leveraging those resources, and then finding out who has the true ambitions on creativity, on sustainability, on technology. And that's actually taking us really new places. The challenge is, of course, to stay focused in those conversations. Hey, everyone. Taking a quick break here to tell you a little bit about our Season 7 presenting sponsor, Lacole School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison, Van Cleef, and Arpels. Lacole brings together teachers, jewelers, art historians, gemologists, designers, lacquer masters, enamelers, setters, lapidaries, mock-up makers, and others to share their passion and knowledge of jewelry with the world. Through courses, conferences, exhibitions, videos, and book publications, Lacole makes the world of jewelry accessible to all. No matter one's experience level, Lacole opens up an incredible art form that has long been reserved for a handful of people. Through a fresh, pioneering approach, Lacole sits at the crossroads of art, gemology, and craftsmanship, and contributes to and consolidates knowledge around the fascinating, vast world of jewelry. You can learn more about Lacole and its current and upcoming offerings at www.lacolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleef. A-R-P-E-L-S dot com. And now, back to the episode. Obviously, there is, at its heart, the design connection to mm. the company. Oh, but, fully, fully. but what I wanted to actually speak with you about today wasn't, like, I was almost hoping we wouldn't even use the word design, because mm, mm. I think the value of your company extends so far outside of the reach of what the design yeah, world no, fully, fully, is. Fully, fully, fully. I had uh, with Konstantin Gretschi, maybe he'll be, now I can say it public, but we had a late night dinner at Floss when Pierre was at Floss. I was a little bit, the, what do you call it? <laughs> I was on design, like design needs to move. I think sometimes design is very much caught in a circuit and it's very replicating itself. And his defense for design was that we, we are just, we're just doing things better and better and better and better. And that's a part of our culture. But I was saying, I think it's a very close circuit. And it, we're it, it really stuck in a silo. Yeah. How do, fully, you, how, do you, fully. how do you break out yeah, of that? Yeah. And, and that's, of course, where with our creative culture, with contemporary art, actually also architecture, those conversations and back to the contemporary art, because this is where contemporary art is ahead. Often I say contemporary art do not know where they're going. They're just sensing something. They're interpreting the world. Sometimes they cannot even formulate what they're sensing. And that's why the power, actually, I think also sometimes, because we're involved in probably five to 6,000 projects around the world in architecture, there's also coming a lot of info back to us, which is outside the design space. So I think, and this is probably where design partly is a little bit, it is caught in its own circuit, I think. And sometimes it's during 
we get the energy right and and things are moving and i like to sign the most when it's contextual when it's working in context and somebody as smart as a designer takes it somewhere else and creates something even better that's when i get the the wow or the soups we say in Danish, like that when when people apply things and take it even further um, so so design i think we are in a way a little bit challenged in design yeah well i will say that a lot of the listeners of time sensitive aren't from or of the design world. So for those listening, actually, yeah, you can go on our timesensitive.fm website and look at all the hyperlinks of the references and the people we've been talking about today. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think it's impossible to have a conversation with you without talking about design, of course. But I think actually so much of the heart of what we're talking about is about creativity at mm, large mm, and, and embedding the thinking that comes with looking at art thinking about art, engaging art, and how that can be applied to the operations of a company, how that can be applied to how employees ponder things, period. And I think that that's really beautiful about what you've been building. I also didn't want to miss the opportunity to talk to you about Abletoft, which is where the company has its headquarters. The majority of its employees live and work there. I mean... When I think about your operations, which really embody quality and slowness, it feels so rooted in this place. I often joke we are like middle of nowhere. We are nowhere. <laughs> the road have no name or they have names. But that's in a way also the power of the business that you have this backbone that is in this, in a way, in a, in a, in a slow, very well-organized, perfectionistic culture People have good lives. People who have, you can say, if you are, if your customer service have a regular job, but also work in the warehouse, you live in your own house, you have a boat, you maybe have a summer house. It's a great life. It's a good life. It's a Scandinavian egalitarian life, well considered. And then we have the tension that we are in New York, Los Angeles, Shanghai, Tokyo, Milan. Grand where, Rapids. <laughs> yeah, which is actually a copy of Appletoft. <laughs> we, we see Grand Rapids is actually our Appletoft. That was to build a backbone in the U.S. So Appletoft is, it has a beauty of Michigan. With a, we are also on a peninsula with a view of the sea from all our rooms. And uh, what we've done in Appletoft is we, we felt originally that we had a little bit of gap between the head office and those... Uh, 45 showrooms around the world and our 40 companies around the world. So it's also trying to build a culture, build a bridge between those cultures. And the uh, actual question who's been on you, <laughs> been here before, Maspia was one of the ones helping, trying to build this bridge. And they're actually promoting contemporary culture, inviting people in, saying even you, you live in... Uh, it's it's not middle of nowhere. It's a very beautiful place, but there's maybe living uh, twelve thousand people in the neighborhood. So we are at the sea. You can fish, you can uh, surf, you can do other things. But it's also a very very small community. But trying to connect those communities and share uh, share the, the content. And uh, one of the things, for example, what I do, I'm uh, I was actually complaining about my senior management team because they didn't join me. Uh, but also I go, uh, when we have these cultural trips, we, we go together. We go, I go with, it's like blue collar workers who's joining. And then we're going to having a museum tour, going to look at architecture, having conversations. So it's also, we really live it. Everybody is going somewhere. We live it or we have people coming during lectures. That's how we try to create, uh, but you need this type of backbone. That's, and is in a way also one of our secrets that you got this, this, uh... Yeah, well, and, and we haven't entirely touched on this incredible legacy. I mean, your father, Poole, founded Kvadrat with Erling Rasmussen in 1968. And going back a bit, you know, it was founded on this principle of producing machine-made fabric w with artistic integrity. So all of what we're talking about has been in the DNA from mm, the start. Mm, mm, fully. And... You know, you've described it as like a hippie company early yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, it's clearly yeah, fully, not fully. a hippie company anymore. But, you know, working with just these incredible creative people, Nana Ditzel, Werner Panton, I mean, 
one of the images I, I've seen looking at the, the company archive that I was hoping maybe you could speak to is Restaurant Varna, which was completed in 1971 in Aarhus, Denmark. And I think it's really this remarkable example of the space shaping power of Kvadra from an early moment. These pops of color, mm. the richness of mm. this space. Mm. Truly. That restaurant would look totally contemporary now. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so I guess this is a roundabout way of asking 55 years on, how do you see this duration, this endurance, yeah, this yeah. Um, this longevity mm. to tie it all back to time? Oh, thank you. It's also something that I realized. Um, there was a show at Vitro Design Museum and they traveled to Louisiana and to Moderna about uh, pop and, and actually trying to show the connection between pop art and actually also art in Castiglione, Gunnar Orgo Anderson, Werner Pence, and many other people trying to build this. I can't remember if they had an architectural. It was actually most design and contemporary art. And there I realized, oh my God, this is who we are. Because Scandinavian design, especially Danish, is so centered on mid-century, like your, in a way also American design. That's like the birth of the modern. And uh, my father grew up in it and knew all those people, Anne Jacobs and Finn Juhl and so on, worked with those people. When that said, Quadrat is, of course, we have a lot of values on quality. That's probably where, like things will last forever and, and no compromise, quality, quality, quality. But, but then said, it was also how my father thought it was actually a, a community that was a little bit, he said, without oxygen. It was very rule-based. It was very quiet. You know, they were smoking pipes or whatever. Tan, tan and gray. Yeah, listening to quiet jazz, which is not a problem. <laughs> we all love a kind of blue. But but it was very, very organized. And and there, so so we are, we are, 68 is extremely important. We are far more connected to pop art. I mean, radical design totally. started that year. Castiglione, Werner Panton, you know, all those things. This is where we are born. And this is also why when we started, we were seen like it was kind of explosive. Our first showroom was, well, there was no furniture. It was all like you're sitting on the floor. We had wild uh, colors. Actually, the Raf Simons logo now for the Raf Simons collection is actually from 68, which is very like it's a comic drawing and so on. So we had this energy. So it was it was being more free, more. And, and that's actually what my father, when I took over the leadership, we were extremely experimental. So he believed it was actually our core idea then to do experimental textiles. So sometimes we did textile. We maybe produced 10 kilometers and we sold nothing. Zero. <laughs> Another thing just to, because I was thinking now we were meeting. Also my own childhood, I grew up, my mother was working with fashion, was a fashion tailor. And my father working for Werner Penton and he was building the shows. So in many ways, I'm actually a Werner Penton kid because mm. my father, they were both engaged and my father should give my mother a lift. My mother was working with Werner Penton on clothes during fashion with him. And my father was building his shows and working with him. And uh, yeah, then he gave her a lift uh, for three hours on a ferry ride. And then uh, I became the product and <laughs> they married. So yeah, it's, 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 that was the beginning. So also growing up, the home was full of prototypes. So I, I grew up seeing prototypes, you know, all textile prototypes, furniture prototypes. So, so it's, yeah, it's been a beautiful ride and, and very engaging. And of course, also a ride that that uh, train your eye. Yeah, well, and, and I should say here that it wasn't always uh, that you were going to become the CEO. In no, fact, no, you, you, no. Tra you went to business school, you trained to be a lawyer, you worked as a lawyer yeah, for a period. Yeah, yeah. And it was only when the company was sold in yes, 1992, yeah. Yeah. a disastrous sale, I suppose, yeah, yeah. and the family was able to buy it back that, yeah. that your journey really started. And I think what's so remarkable is that your, your partner now in the business is also the offspring of who started the company with your father. <laughs> and so that's so rare that like yeah. a family business would continue, but this is actually a, a double family. Yeah, business. it is. Truly, truly, truly. I think the where it has been good for us that we always, we run things with like good governance, you know, things are, we got like a super professional board, we're trying to do things the right way. So it's, 
actually back to the values and the ideas. It was interesting when we were doing new strategy and we did like a 2030 stretch, where should we be in 30? And and the most powerful was actually because we checked in with the family members, but they were so clear on the on the values and the vision and the creativity. So it's lived by the ownership for sure. Yeah. In a conversation last year, you were speaking of Denmark, which connects, of course, to the family thing and and to these egalitarian values. And you describe this idea of being very quiet, doing things in a more sustainable way. This is just part of the very nature of what it means to be Danish, almost, or Scandinavian. Could you speak to this sort of fewer, better things approach to objects living in design and how that's embodied at Kvadra, but also how that is sort of this enduring quality. I mean, I think this this idea of looking at what's around us and how do we, you know, upcycling, for mm-hmm. example, mm-hmm. recycling. Mm-hmm. Also the people inter- creating Scandinavian design in the 50s and so on. It it also came from that we were not so wealthy, to be truthful. <laughs> they were working with elements from farmers, craft people, and so on. So in many ways, it was a, a little bit like Shaker movement in North America. So it was, and in a way, I think Shakers also, they came from Europe, didn't they? Partly from Switzerland and other places. I'm thinking now, too, that you just did this Shaker project yeah, yeah, with, with Raph. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is also very much about you have one space and everything can hang. And so it was also being careful about materials, that you were careful and you did things that really lasted long. Also a tradition, big tradition that things in, uh, you inherit uh, interior and things lasted forever and creating things that lasted that long. Actually, I was just talking with my spouse yesterday, who's an artist and even she's Swedish. Even the Swedes are very respectful to the Danes. She said, like, it's so unfair because you, you, all Danes, we really grow up with it. And in that way, we are a little bit unfairly really ahead and also where we are going because we need to take care of materials. We need to create things that last as long as we can. We need to make things that we can disassemble reuse. We are actually transforming as a business. It's actually one of the big agendas. Now we've been talking a lot about creative culture, but the other very big agenda is a transformation to be a pure leader on sustainability and have leadership on sustainability. What What's happening now, maybe talking about sustainability as one of the major, I don't know how much in the US, but in Europe, you need to get going. You know, you also have the pressure from shareholders and from leadership and and from communities. It's just very difficult if you're starting now. So it's for many people, many companies, it's a leap. This it took 10, 20 years to get here. It took, uh, or even longer. We've been 25 years since we did our environmental management system, since we started working with the EU flower and so on. So it's it's such uh it's it's going to be very tough, but of course we're going to do it. And you're coming out of a culture where it's already just embedded. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. were you were thinking like an activist in your youth. Yeah, exactly. I was actually walking uh, through New York today. I was like, also because I have a lot of love for America, but here I'm like, you're so lost. I see a container, and I just see all kind of things laying there, all everything just mixed together. And you can say, for example, if you go to Scandinavia. We are recycling, we are recycling 97% of all our metals. We are recycling 97% of all paper in Scandinavia. We are recycling 80% of all plastics in Scandinavia. Now we're going to, by law, recycle all textiles. But it's like, what a way, and also it's like we're running out of resources. It's like... <laughs> I mean, so, one of the pieces... One of the items I wanted to bring up is the steel cut beet, which is this textile crafted from 100% post-consumer recycled polyester. That's, I mean, it's not that it's like a wholly original thing to do, but it is a good example of something that you're doing that just shows what is possible. Oh, yeah. I would say this is to be credit to also the U.S. textile community, but the U.S. has been very good here very early. 
And we are working on that also at the moment. I would say we're working on some things very, very innovative about recycling new materials that's coming out very soon. I will not say more because <laughs> somebody will be unhappy about me. But also working with, uh, we created, for example, our main manufacturing place. We have maybe the world's biggest producer of woolen upholsteries. We have a site in Yorkshire, in the UK. We have our own facilities together with a partner. We own half of the facilities. But there we created special machines. Typically in a manufacturing place, you have typically at 10% waste. We have no waste. So from all the woolen waste, we are creating a yarn and we have two products created after that. That's what you call post-industrial wool. You can also create post-consumer wool. At the moment, there's just some challenges with it for cleanness and other things. That's example, you know, also the really projects where we are upcycling textile waste from the fashion industry, from actually furniture manufacturing, and actually also from hospitality, hotel chains and, and other, where we actually recycling their materials and creating. So we're creating circular solutions for clients. So that's extremely exciting at the moment. That's one of the routes we are going. I think what's maybe also for, and, and probably quite a lot of the listeners will know, the big thing is the net zero. It's actually the net zero because one thing is creating circular systems, uh, reducing waste, but the net zero challenge, and that's actually now also with, with the theme of time, is that that's a problem, that it's so abstract. Now we're starting to see signs of it, but that's actually the biggest challenge we got. It's a, it's a, it will be a burning platform for our kids. So that's also one of our big pushes to go on, uh, go from gas to go to electric, electricity and manufacturing, like all our cars are electric in the company. And so on, do, doing things, really moving, see where's your impact and what are you actually going to do to reduce it. On products, I'm just starting to think of also which will go out, there will go a press release out tomorrow on a collaboration on something called PEF, which is a new type of doing polyester that's not fossil based. So it's actually made on food waste and other material, waste material. So we'll create a total new material. It's 10 years of research and we'll be the first working with this material. I so, mean, so what, what I love hearing here is like, this is the upstream conversation, right? Kvadra is an upstream company. Mm -hmm. And what you do, the trickle down of that is extraordinary. And when you think about where we are in the culture, where we are in the planet, where people are talking about resource scarcity, quote mm -hmm. unquote, we actually live in a world of incredible abundance. Mm -hmm. We really do. Mm -hmm. But we probably should not be looking at virgin materials. We should be looking at how do we reuse what's there? For sure. And it sounds like, and based on everything you're doing from you know, committing to net zero by 2040 to producing some of these textiles that are like 100% recycled, that's the future. Mm, fully, fully. I want to finish on photography and poetry. You were mentioning earlier that you have this incredible collection of poetry books at home. You're also an art collector whose collection is largely photography. Mm, and true. thank you. For and uh, you were mentioning your Robert Adams book collection, which sounds extraordinary. Anyway, I, I wanted to finish on poetry and photography also because you started with this exquisite quote about, about the image. Yeah. How do you think about poetry in your day-to-day, -day. What, what does poetry serve for you? Maybe also somebody listening who's saying poetry, this is a commercial for poetry. It's, there's a vibe about poetry at the moment with young people. How, we, we've had quite a few poets on the show. All right, okay, good, good. And I actually went into poetry a little bit. You, we had to read it in school. We, I didn't really like it. And then um, I read an amazing book and... Um, by Henrik Norban, I don't know why he never got the Nobel Prize, but an amazing Scandinavian poet. Then he only read, uh, had been re writing uh, poetry. So I, I want to read something else from him. And then I start reading his poetry and then it totally took off. I was like 18. And then ever since I've been into poetry. So I'm a lot of hunger for poetry. The, the challenge with poetry is truly it's, it's best when it's re, uh, read in its own language, right? With poetry is very specific. It needs to be, it's difficult to translate poetry. I think read aloud too, heard. Yeah, 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 helps. 
Sometimes I talk with people and they say, oh, I dreamt about this. I had a terrible night. I was dreaming about this and this. I actually sometimes have some nights where I'm, I think I'm working all night. That's like at least the worst dream, right? But this is like to, uh, like meditation. So read the five poems before you go to bed. So that's actually one of my, sometimes if it's good, then I just keep going. But I, I even, I just read this and even he's a young poet and not Ocean Wong. Uh, who is, is is probably some of the best things I read the last time as a mother. Yeah, the last five years. You, you're blown away. It's so powerful and so, uh, so I'm actually much. reading a book right now called Your Brain on Art. Okay. And it's by Ivy Ross and Susan Magsiman. Ivy's a former time sensitive guest. Okay. And Susan's been on our other podcast at right. a distance. <laughs> okay. And I'm only bringing this up because it does get into poetry and reading poetry before you go to sleep. Mm. How does it? Yeah. And I think there's something quite profound in this act of slowing down, of not looking at a screen. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, oh, fully. I think with poetry, that's where the clear link is to contemporary art. Of course, it's an art form also on its own, but let's, let's say visual contemporary art. It's also that it's, it's kind of undefined that uh, when you le- read Ocean Wong, of course, it's from, he's reading about a friend going to a mental institution, challenges in life, but he's also, because it's it's abstract, it's very feeling. You you maybe experience something a little bit like this, right? So, so it's also, it's, it's a sharing, due to it's pretty, or it's, it's quite undefined. I think that's, that's a power of poetry. That's a power. I just read... Uh, the national poet of Iran, I know, uh, and and there's a big, big tradition in Iranian poetry or a massive tradition in Persian poetry, and it's written in the 1400s, uh, and uh, he's a major inspiration for Goethe, and it's so straightforward. It's like uh, Ocean Wong, you know. This is also his power that he he writes poetry you can understand. You know, it's not it's you're right on. You you are with him. But also you're reading this poetry and it's actually telling you something about society. And there's a lot of humor and there's a lot of reflection. There's a lot about, so this is where poetry can, or another one, Borges poetry also is one of the ones that have been standing out. Or, But there's so much, there's so much. I, mean, and, I, think, I think about how with Kvadrat, there is also this precision and economy and kind of, directness. Mm -hmm. There's a a very firm directness, you know, when you see these textiles. And I wouldn't be so hyperbolic as to call it a poetic act, what you're doing. It is industrial, but there is in its nature poetry. And I think that that's really compelling. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. So let's switch to photography. And, yeah, and, let's do and it. Then, and, I, keep, and then, I, keep, I keep saying, actually, I dreamt about doing a poetry prize <laughs> or, or collaborating with poets. But of course, it's we become like a culture. That's actually Peter Saville who said, like, mm, mm. you need to be a cultural institution in a good <laughs> sense. But, uh, but maybe it's time. But let's go to photography. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me about your photography collection, your interest in photography. Maybe even we could start with Robert Adams. Why Robert Adams? What? I actually don't own Robert Adams yet. Oh, you don't. <laughs> I only bought all the books. Oh. He's not that expensive, so it's, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's okay. He's, he's on the list. Um, I actually have uh, now, he, if you listen to this, I'm going to get in trouble, but I have a little bit of uh, intellectual discussion with the director of Luciana, which is this amazing museum, Paul Ektoyner, because he's saying to me, Anders, Photography, that's where people start. And photography is not, it's its like a, the first year's primary school in art, and then you'll graduate and get into the real stuff. I actually also, for, for the business, we work a lot with conceptual art, installation, and we have video and yeah, so, so it's not that, um, I actually also own a little bit uh, sculpture and we got some sculptures. But when that said, photography is, it, it even, my spouse is a photographer, Mia Beckstrom, a quite celebrated contemporary. She's in MoMA, Tate, uh, Moderna, and Luciana's collections with photography. And I kind of got to know her because I loved her work, so mesmerized by her work. Uh, so, uh, but when that said, so to see the power of photography, 
I think where photography is very challenged as an art form at the moment is that, first of all, it's of course, it's all about content. This is where people sometimes go wrong. If you see a photography uh, auction or something, there's a mix of things that are not contemporary art. Contemporary art photography, the idea is the center. And of course, photography is just a way to show the idea. And this is where it goes wrong when, when you see fashion photographers or other people, it's oppressed, which is amazing. It's just not art. How powerful a piece of contemporary art a photography is, is very much, of course, all about the core idea and the artistic expression. Then you can have beauty, but that's, that's the core. The other exposure of photography is that we all got uh, smartphones. So we all got, I got like, I love to take pictures. So I probably got like 24,000 pictures in my phone right now. And some of them are pretty good, right? So we're all small artists. <laughs> so it doesn't make it easy to be a contemporary artist to working with photography as a media. It's just given me so much energy. Because we are supporting Nan Golden and her European tour, which is very exciting. And we're helping with material building her cinemas. There's like four or five small architectural spaces and we're helping with materials on that. And I, I always adored her work. And I think, and then I just bought it. And saying Nan, how, what she, her story about uh, the community in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, of course, also her activism later, try to express that in an installation or in a painting. So I think for me, I actually think photography, now you, you're making me, I'm getting warm, we say in Danish. <laughs> I think it's, it's actually more relevant to contemporary culture. It's actually also the life we live, the now. I think it's very much the now. I probably also would like to have some paintings, but it's, for me, it's a little back leaning. It's not leaning into the future. Also, I actually didn't want to buy it. I met him in Tokyo. I thought, no, oh, it's too quiet. It's a little, is it really boring? Sugimoto. Uh, but it just, I couldn't get, every time I look at the sea, I think of him. Or very <laughs> often when I fly, I think of Sugimoto. This is, a, so th then I had to <laughs> buy it. Next time in the movie theater, you'll yeah. think of <laughs> I had to buy a seascape. So, so there's those things, or I have a work, for example, even, uh, I, I, I think his most important work where he's arrested in the elevator and uh, standing two Chinese uh, police agents who is uh, holding him in his arms and standing a friend next to him and they're holding him on his arrest and he's standing in the elevator and he just takes his smartphone out and take a picture in the mirror, right? Try to do that in some other art form. So I think there's a now, there's an instant element in, in, in photography. And now talking about Robert Adams, Think of how he, in a way, he's the whole story about the West. And uh, many people interpret him as uh, like a critique of what's gone. I have, no, no, it's, uh, it's the, his forefather, what's his name? Uh, Assembled. Ansel Adams? Yeah, yeah, I, have his, I just bought a work of his, which is very, very like his work. You know, in a way, he's standing on the back of him. Adams is it's, it's a work that looks very much like Adams' works. But Adams' works is about a lot of other things. He has this book. It's about his home. He's now, I think on my memory, he's in his 70s, or maybe 80s. He's in his home. It's, it's a book only about his home. He has this beautiful, relatively, I think for American standards, small wooden house uh, in nature. And then he's describing his home. He's it is poetry. He's describing the clouds. He's describing the laundry. He's describing. Oh, there's another one book that's actually my favorite. It's called "The Root Through the Pines," where he drives to his house. So it's just pictures of this route when he's driving through the pine trees. But also after I saw that, I, I will never forget this route through the pine trees, right? So it's cinematic also at the same time. So I'm, I'm <laughs> I think <laughs> photography is very, very exciting. It's, it's, uh, so yeah, I'll keep, even I'm now it's in a way nearly a little bit out of fashion photography, but I spoke with some of the curators and they're saying, yeah, so what art is always moving somewhere. So, so that's my excitement. Yeah. <laughs> How do you think about the quote that you started this interview, this conversation with in that context. And I, I think we'll end there. I'd love to hear what that quote means to you when thinking about 
photography, thinking about poetry, and ultimately thinking about Kvadrat? <laughs> um, I think a lot of things going to disappear, for sure. A lot of imagery going to disappear. Also, somebody was very tough to me about the photography, that photography today is actually in 100 years, most of the photography will be, <laughs> will, will, it will be dissolved. So, okay, I, I hope there will be a solution. So things will disappear. And I, I think Quadrat will last. I, I really think it's built to last. Uh, I think... Uh, I think we are reaching into the value. Our community is getting bigger. We, we, we I, th I think actually also truly myself as a CEO, and I took the company to this, and I'm planning to still take uh, the next chapter. But then, of course, then when that chapter is over, I, I think I will also disappear. And it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. It's the energy, the passion, and we move some things. Some of the products, some of the designers will, will last probably the next uh, 500 years. Also, some of the contemporary artists we're working with, they will have a legacy. They will live in the future. And we will probably be forgot. They will not listen to our podcast and they would not worry who was the CEO of Karat. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Ephemeral. And yeah, what a beautiful statement on time. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> taking me in here. Extra thanks to our Season 7 presenting sponsor, Lacole School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison, Van Cleef, and our pals. A unique place for learning, Lacole welcomes the general public to the world of jewelry through courses, conferences, exhibitions, videos, and book publications. You can find out more about Lacole at www.lacolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And thank you for listening. You can find more episodes of Time Sensitive on our website, timesensitive.fm, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at slowdown.tv. And if you like our programs, please be sure to subscribe and leave comments. Our theme music was composed by Billy Martin. This episode was produced by Ramon Broza, Emily Jang, and Johnny Simon.